situation where we see some of the same kinds of pressures. A imagine a distributor of an expensive product or consumer durable purchases units of products one at a time from the manufacturer. The distributor then goes off and tries to sell these units as best they can. Uh, I had an example with this. My daughter was working with um, really large-scale confocal microscopes that cost about a quarter million dollars a piece. And the distributor never keeps more than one in inventory, and every time he sells one, he gets another one from the manufacturer. But it's up to the distributor to negotiate the price. Um, once again, because in this case, um, the customers come to the distributor sequentially. Um, it costs him to continue to sell. He has to keep staff. He has to, in the case of the microscope, he actually had to keep engineers on hand to pay them whether he was selling or not uh, to do the setup. And then finally, more and more saliently for this, the customers would check out the distributor, they'd check out the microscope, they'd check out the laboratories that had purchased the microscope before, and in the process would generally find out what the laboratories paid for this microscope. Uh, and that tended to set the focal point for where the negotiation began. Um, software. I happened to uh, do a consulting uh, project for a, a software company, and one of the things that the CEO of this company was most worried about was, what do I set for my initial price? And I asked, well, why are you so worried about your initial price? And the CEO said to me, well, I'm never going to be able to raise this price for the same product. If I want to raise the price, I'm going to have to make something. I'm going to make more than that. So if I, if I set a price and it flies off the shelf, I've done the wrong thing. My price Once again, we see this sort of this feeling that, um, and I think this is pretty pervasive in technology. I can't sell the same old product six months from now at a higher price than I sell it today. Uh, in this case, it's nice from an analytical standpoint. There's no inventory cost. Since it's software, it's not like you have a bunch of these on the shelf sitting in your computer. You're just waiting for the next guy to come along so you can sell them and license to use. Finally, and this is a little closer to home, Think about a retailer sell, selling identical units of some consumer technology product via Amazon or eBay. One of the things that you can do, uh, customers can check out things like Camel, Camel, Camel for Amazon or Therapy for eBay to actually find a history of price for this product. Uh, I think almost everybody does that. Now. You don't just go to Amazon and say, how much is it? I think I'll buy one. There's lots of ways to find out. And just to show you that, there might be some empirical validity. So in this case, it's not a perfect match with the model that I'm going to propose. Because what these services do is they give you a sample of sales. Uh, but to see that, what I'm talking about happens, here's uh, Camel, 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 which will give you Amazon's price history for sales. I think the green, is, the green graph is Amazon's price for a Samsung 46-inch TV, HDTV from uh, February 10th to August 10th. Um, and we see a downward trend. This is the 42 inch. Um, it'll tell you Amazon, it'll tell you third party sellers, and it'll tell you the used market. It's a little hard to see because I took these PDFs and sort of stretched them into the this presentation. And here's a uh, 16 gigabyte Wi-Fi only iPad. Once again, we see on all of these graphs. Now, I'm not saying every product works this way. If you were to look at um, antique cars, you wouldn't necessarily see a downward trend in price all the time. It, the price might be more reflective of the economy. If the economy is good, antique cars go for more. If the economy is bad, they go for less. And you might just see random fluctuations. I'm talking, the thing that interested me in this was uh, technology problems. And so, we got interested in how these things are sold. And now this, the second thing we're interested in in this research is how do prices get set? And we have in mind a very primitive form of selling in which a seller encounters potential buyers one at a time, randomly in time. The buyers have different values that they're willing to pay for the object. And the seller has to decide. The buyer comes and makes me an offer. Do I accept that offer? We've seen this kind of set up more or less on you have a, a buy it now price. People who might like to buy your product come along, if, it, if their value for the product, what they're willing to pay is larger than the buy it now price, you get a transaction of the next Again, approximations to the kind of model. Um, 
So that's pretty much how it works. Um, we're going to assume in the classical model of sales via sequential search, we assume that potential customers are independent. So my value for the object and your value for the object, while they may be drawn from the same distribution, we may share the same average value for one of my purchases. Yours might be higher than mine. Um, and the fact that yours is very far above than me and doesn't affect whether mine is far above or far below than me. That would be patently not true in the examples I just went through. And that's the seed of where the research started. This assumption that people's values are all independent and unchanging uh, just doesn't seem to work in a lot of technology products where our belief is their expectation is actually for declining prices for the same services. Um, the rest of this is just the economics. We assume that the seller pays a cost per unit time to stay in the market. Um, each, potential oh, each potential buyer uh, reveals his reservation price, which is the price he's willing to pay. The seller sells to the first buyer whose reservation price exceeds the critical threshold. This is the classical optimal result for sequential search. The optimal way to sell in a very simple market like this is to set a threshold, sell the first time you get an offer above that threshold. Um, this model was used mostly at first in labor markets. And let's just take a look and see how it fits labor markets. The seller is a job seeker. Customers are firms with jobs to fill. Um, there's a distribution of salaries. Each wage offer is drawn from this distribution. Um, the employers set their wages to offers independently. So far, it makes sense if you think about large employers and a small number of people seeking employment. I don't really think if I get a job at Hewlett Packard, it's going to materially affect what they're going to offer other people for the same job category. So this model fits pretty well in this setting. Um, the job seeker balances the cost of soliciting extra offers, the extra wage they might get from looking more, versus what they're giving up by not working. Um, and again, a very simple rule, the job seeker will set a threshold, they'll take the first job uh, that pays more to sit. This is, of course, assuming that you are operating in an economy that does have jobs. It's a bit theoretical at this point. Um, Let's try the same reasoning for retail sales, and I think you'll see where it comes up a little short. Imagine now our seller is a retailer, and the customer is a consumer who comes into a store, or uh, calls them on the phone, or responds to an ad, or responds to an eBay listing. There's some distribution of values for the product among consumers. Fine. That makes sense. Some people like iPads more than other people. Um, the consumer, upon arriving at the retailer, offers an amount equal to the value he places on the product and either makes a transaction or he doesn't. Uh, the retailer either accepts or rejects the offer. I guess what I want to ask at this point, when is the last time any of you behaved that way in a retail store? <laughs> you go in, you say, that's how much I think that's worth. It's way more than the price you posted. Fine, let's make a deal. <laughs> There's something drastically wrong with the search reasoning. Uh, for retail type. Um, the big issue, in the classical model, customers are clueless. Uh, it's like opening your wallet and saying, is this enough for the bread you know, or for the groceries? Uh, we need to fix this. Um, customers never haggle. Customers never talk to other customers. Come on. Anybody who's bought a technology product, see somebody else who's bought that technology product later and has remorse. Oh, I bet I paid too much. You don't have to admit to it. We know what happens. It's called being a human. Um, and they don't care if they got a good deal. This is in the classical model. These are my sort of pet peeves with the classical search model. Works OK for wage, wage search, doesn't work OK for real items. Um, so we set about to think about how we could attack some of these weaknesses in the classical search model when thinking about the spider cell. And so we thought, uh, first, customers aren't just going to offer what they think the, the object is worth. They're going to offer what they think you'll take for it. Um, they'll modify what they offer based on what custom, other customers have paid. So if I think an iPad is worth 500 bucks to me, and I know the last one sold at 250, I'll go in at 250, not at 500. The classical model would have me offer 500. Uh, well, at least at least slightly more shrewd than. Um, the simple model. Um, so that means, however, the distribution of what you get offered as a retailer is not the same for each customer. It depends on previous, on your previous decisions, what you sold at, and 
uh, the previous decisions of other customers. Now, we're going to simplify the world vastly by assuming we've got one retailer. He's a monopolist. And his competition is against the customers that arrive. This would be like a unique technology product where you have the only, the only license, or you're the only person who can license this technology. Um, this causes an offer distribution that declines with time. Since nobody offers more than the previous price, there's only one direction for price to go. The question is how fast do you want to get there? The literature, I'll go quickly through the literature, it's vast. Um, <coughs> some related literature. Uh, these are just papers that talk about different ways of changing. So this paper is interesting in which uh, Rubenstein looked at this problem and he said, suppose that the market is entirely a haggling market. Suppose everybody is willing to haggle forever. And the only thing that keeps them from stopping is the time value of money that they're impatient because they have a discussion. And he gets an equilibrium, but it's not a very, not a very attractive equilibrium in a lot of ways. He gets uh, an equilibrium where people sort of come to, come to price agreements very quickly, which doesn't seem to be what we see in practice. A nice, there's a nice paper also that does very, very difficult mathematics to talk about what happens uh, when, the, when the offer distribution changes. So that's a, that's a, a view of what's going on. Um, I've got more references in the paper if you're interested. So here's our simple model. Stop at 15 minutes and we'll release down to the model that we propose. Um, there's a single seller who has K or an infinite number of items to sell. Um, we're going to look at the infinite item case today. Customers arrive according to the price on process. That's mathematics where customers arrive randomly and continuously in time. Um, each arriving potential buyer has a willingness to pay drawn from some distribution. F, we're going to assume it's on some interval. Um, and it has a positive density. It's going to be continuous. That's going to turn out to be pretty important, but not crucial. The prevailing price is always the most recent sales price or the upper bound of the price distribution if there has yet to be a sale. Seller pays a cost C per unit time. This is his cost of doing business. Um, and costs and revenues are discounted continuously at some rate now. So everybody's impatient. Everybody would rather have money today uh, more, than it, more than the same amount of money tomorrow. Um, and we're going to say decisions only take place when something happens in the system. Customer arrives and makes an offer, then we make a decision. If we decide to sell, we do the transaction. If we decide not to sell, we wait for the next customer. Don't do anything between arrivals. With an uh, assumption of Poisson arrivals, that turns out to be a fairly harmless, fairly harmless assumption. Uh, what can the seller do? Well, high price at the beginning, since it's never going up. Price is never going up. Um, they could commit to a fixed price. The seller could just say, oh heck, I know the price will work down. I'm going to be tough. I'm just going to set the price for the iPad. In. 500 bucks, and I won't budge. And I don't care if I don't sell them. Perhaps not an easy threat to carry out, but certainly something one could imagine. When you go to the store, they post a price. They don't argue. It's Americans, by the way, tend to be peculiar about this. We tend not to argue with posted prices. Almost every other culture in the world argues with posted prices. Price, those, are, those are suggested prices. Many, many other prices. So we tend to be we're confrontation averse. It doesn't seem that way from our foreign policy, but um, <laughs> at a personal level, we seem to be a bit confrontation averse. Um, the other thing, maybe the seller will quit at some point. Maybe unable to keep a reasonable price, they'll get to the point where the cost of selling exceeds the, what he's going to make from future sales, and just says, I'm done. And he goes out of business. Or he creates a new product. He says, it's time to retire this product. We need something with more features. That we can ramp the price, ramp, we can we can ramp the price up again, and I suspect this is one of the reasons you see in technology companies a sort of product cycle. I got a little insight into this many many years ago, uh, working for Hewlett Packard, when I asked them about their this is when they were first getting into the laser printer business their laser printer strategy. And they said, well, we make a printer, we sell it for a while, competition appears. They didn't have a lot of competition. 
this time. And then we split the product. We make a cheap one, and we make a better one. The better one can have a higher price, and the cheaper one will get the people who wouldn't pay the current price. Uh, so there's a sense in which the dynamics of that kind of product strategy uh, use, take, take, takes into account prices. Okay, some math. You've got to have some math. Um, we want to know what the optimal thing to do is. So we'll call the optimal return V of X and U, where X <coughs> is the prevailing price and the current offer is U. So we, we know what the prevailing price is. We know what our last sale was. We know what the guy who just walked in the door has offered us. Uh, we want to figure out the optimal thing to do. Um, that, there it is. Functional equation. Game over. Not particularly elucidating. Oh, clear? <laughs> okay, let's expand on what this says a little bit. Um, we can compress this a little bit. The key thing here is I'm reflecting, by the way, the change in the offer distribution by the subscript X, which is the previous, previous price. Okay, so how does this work in words? Somebody arrives, you know what the prevailing price is, they have an offer in hand, you want to know whether to accept it or not, you want to know what to do. You can accept it and quit. You can accept it and continue. You can reject it and continue. Here, it's too low, it will jeopardize future sales. You don't want to do that. Here, it's good, it's not going to jeopardize future sales, and you're going to continue. Here, well maybe you were getting toward the end, the price was pretty low, you knew if you accepted this offer, the prevailing price would be too low to continue, but you take it, and then you get out of it. And you can see that shown in the math, I hope. Uh, we can safely ignore the option of rejecting and then ceasing because we've got a positive lower bound. Um, so here's how the math looks with the words. That's what you get. So prevailing price, current offer. If you accept and stop, you get you. That's it. That's, this is your expected, va expected future value, expected future return. Um, accept and continue, well, you get the price they offer, and the prevailing price now becomes what they offered, and you have to continue to pay some search costs. And you could reject and continue, in which case the state variable stays at x, not, it doesn't move to u, but you don't get anything. So this is this is where you're being really cautious. You're saying, I'm not going to take that offer because it's too low. It's going to set too strong a precedent. And, uh, oh, and I, I've simplified the recursion by taking one of these integrals and redefining it, integrating out the uh, next offer. OK, what's the optimal policy? Um, two issues. When do I stop? And what offers do I accept? Stop is easy. When the prevailing price is so low that there's no way you can continue and make money, you stop. That's called bankruptcy. A lot of people have run into this condition. Um, how do you decide? So that's when you stop. Is if you can sell what the, the, the intuition here is, if you can sell even one more unit profitably, then being able to continue is worth it. If you can't sell even one more unit profitably, no, no, other, no sales of other units are going to do any better because the price never goes up, which makes the stopping decision easy. Um, the selection decision, turns out there is a modified threshold rule that depends on the prevailing price. And um, you can prove lots of things about what the rule looks like. I thought what I'd do in the interest of time um, is um, yeah, just go. These are just mathematical properties for the threshold and uh, the value. It has some features of standard search models, increasing the offer distribution benefits to the seller. We're just trying to look at some comparative stacks here. Increasing search cost benefits to sell uh, causes the seller to sell less quickly. That should be more quickly, not less quickly, but that's okay. Um, it's decreasing. See, um, unlike standard search models, variability uh, doesn't have um, doesn't always benefit the seller. Those are more mostly technical. This is the really interesting question, in my view, in this in this part of the paper. 
So we talked about this deciding to stop when the prevailing price is too low. We talked about having a threshold, only taking offers above a certain level. We haven't answered the question of, well, do people really quit? Does a seller who has a potential infinite number of things they can sell, do they stop early? Or can they protect the price enough so that they can keep going forever? You could imagine two, two choices. I'm going to be very cautious. I'm going to start with a high price. I'm going to wait a long time between sales, but I'm not going to let the price fall very fast. You could imagine another guy who says, no, no, I need to make some money now. I know this is going to be bad in the future no matter what. Let's let the price drop. Let's take some medium-sized offers and let the price drop. Question. Does that, remember, this guy in this model is a monopolist. There's one seller. The only people he's competing against are the buyers. And they're not real smart, but they're smart enough to know what the last price was. Does he continue forever? Can he protect himself? And the answer is no. Um, we can actually calculate the expected length of time until he quits. The intuition is pretty simple. Um, Imagine that the prevailing price has drifted down or something. I've accepted a few offers that's drifted down or something. And I know there's a level that I can easily calculate where if the prevailing price drops below this level, I have to quit because I won't be able to make any money. But suppose somebody comes in and offers me just epsilon below that threshold. That still could be a lot of money. And I say to myself, gee, if I'm very close to this threshold, what I'm going to make in the future isn't very much. And I've got this guy who's got a nice offer, let's take it and quit. And because I value money now more than I value money later, I take it and I'll stop. And you can calculate, you can get the, you can get the moments. Um, it requires a little bit of Minecraft process theory to get the bounds, but it's not, again, it's a fairly straightforward thing. Um, there's what I just said. Uh, let's take a look at this, what the policy looks like. So far I've told you some things about it, but let's actually do one. So here's a case, uh, the value distribution between one and two, the seller pays, pays, pays a wholesale cost of one, so he's making about a 50% mark up here, or a little less, the average of that would be one and a half. Um, he's got a discount rate, and he has a cost incurred for selling, and let's take a look at his policy. Here's the policy. It's colored. And it always comes out different colors every time I show it. Anyway, um, down here, he rejects these offers. So along this axis is the prevailing price. Along this axis is the offer he gets. He's never going to get an offer, and he's never going to get an offer above the last, above the prevailing price. So he's never going to get an offer in here. He's never going to get an offer above the 45 degree. Down here, these are the offers where he rejects and he continues selling. Up here, these offers are good enough to accept and continue selling. And down here, he'll accept the offer in hand and then he'll quit. And the way to sort of read the dynamics of what happens from this diagram is, well, he'll start out here. When he has no offers, he starts out over here. Um, maybe he gets an offer here. Well, if we go over here, that means he's down about here now. His prevailing price is down around here. So suppose he gets, a, he gets an offer just in this yellow zone here. That's going to take him all the way over here, and he keeps going by reflecting off this center until he gets right to a prevailing price below, say, about 0.3. Once he gets over in this region, if he gets an offer in here, he accepts it and he quits. If he gets an offer up here, he keeps going, which means he's going to move farther in this direction. And down here. So, and so once you get over here, so this is the region, this little triangle here, is the region he works himself into where he quits. And that sort of shows you how, uh, by the process of making these little myopic decisions, even though they're optimal decisions, even though they optimally take into account the discounted value of future returns, he works himself into a position where he'd rather quit than continue sales. This has an interesting implication economically for products sold uh, by distributors. So imagine you're making a product, you can't sell it yourself because you're a manufacturer, you hire a distributor, you're on a wholesale cost type basis. This says your distributor, absent some support, some rule supporting the price, uh, will compete until he will drop you. And that's going to be a pain because then you've got to find a new distributor and start over again. 
So the logical thing for the distributor to want to do is to want to, or the, the manufacturer to want to do, is to tell the distributor, here, you can be my distributor, but you must charge at least this amount to keep this from happening. The unfortunate thing about that strategy is that was illegal until 2007. That was an antitrust violation. Except in 2007, the Supreme Court heard a case involving a leather goods manufacturer, a leather clothing manufacturer, who had done exactly this with people distributing his products. And he thought that was really unfair, that he was only protecting his business. He went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, it's okay. You can, you can as a condition of being a distributor, the manufacturer can make a minimum price a condition of being a distributor. What is really cool was we didn't know about that decision when we started the model. So we did the analysis. We thought, hey, there's a big incentive for people who want to put price floors on their products. And then a friend of mine who does law and economics said, well, yeah, you should, you should check this out. It's, it works pretty much exactly the way you said manufacturers want to do this. I love it when life imitates art like that. Um, so that was kind of the one nice surprise of this research. Uh, this is just a picture with guidelines so you can actually see where, um, how, you, how you get into this trap of quitting down here. Um, so that was sort of one nice thing about this work. Um, there's some corollaries. Let's skip the corollaries because I'm getting close. There's the, uh, there's the court case. Um, oh, one, one question one might reasonably ask is, you ha I had to assume that there was some density that described the distribution of offers. Is this just an artifact of having a continuous offer distribution? We know that prices aren't really continuous. They're denominated in pennies or dollars or something. The answer is no. You can construct discrete models where you have only a finite number of possible offers that people might make that will display the same behavior, where the seller will quit. Um, and I did a couple of those just for fun, but I think to get to the more fun stuff at the end, I'm going to skip over these for now. I can go back to them if you get interested. So there's what we call an agency problem. In sales by distributors. Now, this would be different. It's, it also suggests that what one needs to look very carefully at is the shape of the contract one uses for one's distributor. In this particular case, the distributor would bought the product at a wholesale price um, and then pocketed the difference between the wholesale price and the sales price for the product. What if instead we had an arrangement where the, where the distributor pocketed a percentage of the sales price? We could have also sold on consignment, where we set the price. He sells in it as a, a, as a consignment sale, and then we, we get, the, the manufacturer gets a percentage of the sales price. Those, all of those things would change, perhaps change the incentive for the distributor. Second thing in this work that kind of caught my eye was the reason our seller competes himself out of business is because he's impatient, and that's because he discounts future revenue. He'd rather have a dollar now than a dollar later. Um, and then, of course, we started looking at the quantitative easing, and we saw what was happening to interest rates in the United States. And we thought, well, what if interest rates are really, really low? So the future, future money and current money are about the same. Does this problem go away? Um, and so we got to looking at what happens in small discount rates. So that's the, this is the same picture I showed you earlier. But this is with a discount rate cut by a factor of, uh, I think we divided it by 10 to the fourth. And what you see is, it turns out this line here where the dots are is actually yellow. It's just really, really narrow. And I did had to do this numerically, so it's, there's a, a limit to the resolution. So what happens in here is he, he accepts very few offers. He really only accepts things that are above the prevailing price. Actually, he accepts at the prevailing price. Now remember. Once we've gotten, once we've started selling and say we're here, what's actually happening is every customer who comes in whose value is above the prevailing price offers the prevailing price. If he accepts only those offers, the price won't change. And so what's happening is it's moving kind of slowly here, but it still moves down. And what you can show is that that happens at all positive interest rates. So then we got interested in uh, average return. Suppose the seller no longer um, no longer worries about the time value of money, 
He just wants to maximize the time average return. He just wants to maximize his rate per hour. So a dollar now, a dollar later, it doesn't matter. I just want to maximize the rate per hour involved in sales. Turns out it's easy. One thing that you might expect him to do in this case is simply to post the price. Say, look, I'll sell, it. I'll sell to anybody who offers more than this price. And you set the price to maximize the time average. And it turns out it's easily done. Uh, this is an easy result. Um, a not so easy result is that the optimal policy to use in the time average case is a post price. That takes a little work to prove. It's not, I said harder, I didn't say difficult. Just like harder than easy. Um, and what you can show is among stationary policies, if you assume that the offer distribution has an increasing failure rate, there is a unique optimal price to post among possible prices you could post. And that is indeed what the seller will do <coughs> if he doesn't discount, if all he wants to do is uh, maximize his time average uh, return. There's an intuition for this, which may not be intuitive. Uh, so why is that true? One way of thinking about this is if we were to fix a prevailing price, some sort of policy, say a threshold policy. And then um, what happens is when the prevailing price is X and is using a threshold policy, he certainly accepts every offer above X because anybody who valued the product above X offers X. So this is the rate at which he's making deals when the prevailing price, without, without changing the prevailing price. Uh, every once in a while, he'll accept something a little bit lower and the price will change. And it'll change, it'll move downward to some number S, and there'll be a new rate at which he's earned. So if you think about the prevailing, his rate of his rate of earning at a given prevailing price looks a lot like prevailing price uh, F bar is one minus F of X. And what you can show is then his total return looks like something like an integral against something that looks like an occupancy measure. And uh, but it, the important thing is it has this term in here, which is optimized uh, at the optimal at the optimal posted price. So it gives a role for posted prices in this search frame, which wasn't there in the discount case. So he doesn't have to, in the, in the case where there's no discounting, where all he cares about is average costs, um, he doesn't compute himself out of business. He does do the fairly obvious rational thing, which is to say, if I'm going to post a price and stick to it, I'll pick the best one. Um, and so you get them slightly different behavior, which is kind of nice to link up these, these two ideas. Okay. Um, where are we going with this? Um, it'd be nice to get a little nicer, sharper <coughs> characterization of the selection policy in general. I can draw pictures. I can calculate it numerically. It'd be nice if we could characterize it a little more sharply. Um, what happens if you only if, if we go back to our original model, and um, you only have a finite number of items to sell? Go back to our original problem with the guy with the 50 condos and the project that's out of that's out of money, who has to sell 50 identical condos but just 50. Do things change when you have a, actually a finite number of objects to sell? You know you're going to be doing this for only a finite amount of time. And uh, there are other models that involve post prices, and it'd be nice to compare our results. And then one thing I'm very interested in is simplified selling strategies. Um, I can calculate the optimal thing to do in the discounted case using MATLAB and a whole bunch of assumptions about the offer distribution. But let's think about a real person starting a real business who may not be perfectly aware of how much his customers value the product he's selling. Are there simplified selling strategies that don't require all of this detailed knowledge about the probability distribution of the value of the object across the population of consumers? Are there good strategies that don't require that much information? Those would seem to be the kinds of things that would be much more practical for people actually starting and running businesses. And that's one of the things that's high on my priority list. Robust strategies that don't require a lot of information. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, I put some proofs at the end in case you get bored. <laughs> Any questions? Questions? 
Does, does it change at all if you like a direct sales model? Like, like Apple has the Apple store and you also are our manufacturer. That's an interesting one. So would the manufacturer compete himself out of business? Um, I mean, the Apple Store will have a tendency to compete. It's not so much the store. Okay, for the store, it's not such a big issue because Apple Central is going to set prices, right? But if we think of the store and Apple together, they have the distributor's problem. And they have an even worse problem. Well, of course, they don't have a problem right now because they're sitting on is it 50 billion in cash. <laughs> so in the case of Apple, this is only an academic exercise. Um, in fact, their shareholders have been getting a little bit antsy that they're sitting on a lot of cash. One of the things we teach in the business school is the best way to make money is to give the cash to management. <laughs> you're supposed to give it back. You're supposed to give it back to the shareholders when you make it. I know that's going to come as a big shock, but that's what they're actually supposed to do. That's the theory of it. Um, they do have that, as, in a, as an aggregate organization, they do have the same pricing problem, which would be, okay, what do I sell the iPad at? And there, they also have to figure they need to make enough money to keep making new ones. They need so there are, there are other issues in terms of making money. They know, for example, one of the things I didn't show you in some of the price graphs was if you look at some of these products from their inception, you do get a pop at the beginning. That they they'll they'll misprice it a little bit and it'll pop up. I showed you consumer products that had a short lifetimes like uh, big screen TVs. We know the price has been coming down. We know the technology has been evolving. Uh, but if you look at some other products where there was a novelty aspect to it, you do get a little, you can get a little pop up in price. Um, but yeah, they have this problem. It's probably not as easy to, to create a simple model that describes all of their issues. Yeah. Yes? So what about software, like um, game developers that sell games and they're really popular, like Minecraft, and they oversaturate their market? Mm -hmm. Does yeah. that fit into this? They also have a problem that their marginal cost of production is very, very low. Once you once you put the effort in to make the game, selling an additional copy costs you next to nothing. So their C in this model is really tiny, which causes the prices potentially to spiral down really quickly. Um, there, it's more of a you, you do have and, and, and there's some complexities in the game market that I haven't talked about here. Like for example, word of mouth that a game can start out kind of slow. Um, people start to play it, people start to like it, it gets out on Facebook and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden there's a big rush to buy it. So the game one, the game situation, the people I've talked to have made sort of from the management side making games, it's a little bit more like the movie or the recording industry, where you're looking for a hit. But you do have this rapid, if you look at the retail store, you do this rapid price decline at the end. Once the game is out, it's no longer, once you've sort of stamped the novelty part out, prices do that. So it could be the same thing. With no no floor. Yeah. Do you ever take into account how much of the profit should go into developing the next generation of the product in order to stay in business? That was the complexity I managed to sidestep okay. by by separating responsibility for this into the distributor and the manufacturer. Okay. I'm assuming that that question was answered by the manufacturer when he set the wholesale price. Okay. But yes, it's important, and I sidestepped it. 